what I want to emphasize is not so much the diseases themselves, but the impact of these diseases on poor populations and their link with poverty. Now, what has happened in this journey, which started nearly 20 years ago, is that we've moved from looking at individual diseases to basketing these diseases with long names into what we call the NTDs. And I think that has been part of the branding success because people can't spell schistosomiasis or onchocerciasis or leishmaniasis or even know what they are. But when you package these diseases together as diseases which affect billions, not, we're not talking about 37 million HIV cases with respect to the HIV community, we are talking about probably one in three or four people on the planet affected by these infections, some of which are polyparasitizing with them. You don't just have malaria, you have worms with malaria, you have two or three different worms inside your gut or inside your blood. So you're talking about a challenge to the system. But what we've done really is to package these conditions as drivers of poverty and also the cause of poverty. When we started, we had no ambitions in the sense of having these diseases within the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals spelled out two conditions. They spelled out HIV and malaria. They didn't spell out TB, they didn't spell out polio. But now we have the neglected tropical diseases included within the health targets of the Sustainable Development Goals with the, obviously, the, the health target, the key, number three. But what I've done here, and it's in one of the papers I'll give you, with Matthew Bonga at WHO, is identify the links between all the Sustainable Development Goals and the neglected tropical diseases. I won't go through them, they're on the slide, but they link to hunger, they link to obviously healthy lives, they link to education because of the impact of worms on the ability to uh, learn and grow and develop. There's issues around equality and disproportionate impact, particularly schistosomiasis on females, and particularly the issue of urogenital schistosomiasis and its linkage to HIV. There is issues around water and sanitation which are self-evident, but in terms of sustainability of urban settings, the relationship between urban development and the uh, outbreaks and epidemics of dengue, the issues of climate change, the issue of the interface between humans and animals because that is a critical strategy, the One Health strategy, for looking at what we call the zoonotic diseases. 70% of human infections come from animals, probably more. And the interface where you have climate change, you have ecological change, you have environmental change, are all likely to be drivers of what Peter's described as emerging infections. The other thing about the NTD community is it's very much based on hugely successful alliances. Now I show this slide because first of all it shows you some of the clinical conditions which affect people, real people, and the impact of some of the infections like trachoma and onchocerciasis, blinding people permanently, irreversible blindness, disablement associated with filariasis and yaws, similarly with filariasis with male genital uh, lesions, schistosomiasis or bilharzia with uh, liver involvement, cutaneous leishmaniasis causing enormous stigma, grossly underestimated. But the reason I show this slide is because the impacts are not just on the disease. Their social impacts on marital prospects, issues around the burden on carers who have to look after disabled people and if they're children they're deprived of education. So their life prospects are deeply affected. Those children also have less educational performance. And people who are disabled can't work so they can't afford to send their children to school. The impact on agricultural productivity, because you can't farm, is profound. So you have impact on nutritional status. And people fall back on staples uh, instead of cash crops because that creates a problem in nutritional diversity. So all these things interact. And this slide is designed as a cog because it shows the interactions between all these issues. Now, as far as the post-2015 agenda is concerned, I've mentioned that we have a situation where we've moved from, let's say, disease-specific focus for policy purposes to looking at these diseases through the lens of poverty. Equity, how investment in NTDs is going to strengthen health systems. And I don't want this community in particular to look at these interventions as vertical interventions. They're embedded in the health system. They are embedded 
in the programs that the district medical officers have in African settings. I also want to make the point that innovation is not necessarily, as I'll show you some examples later, about people in white coats in laboratories developing drugs. The time frame to development of drugs is 20 years, at least. So don't expect magic bullets to come out of laboratories, unless there are conditions that might affect the West, i.e. Ebola. There's an important issue of advocacy here, linking to other diseases. Malaria, HIV and polio, we have specific examples of how NTD programmes have worked closely and effectively with these major programmes. And the economic case, I purport, and I think it's borne out by the evidence that is emerging all the time, <coughs> these are some of the best buys in public health in terms of cost of uh, delivery, economic rates of return, and the fact we're reaching a billion people a year. No other programme's reaching a billion people a year. Anywhere. If you can name one, please do. You're the health advisors. But always, in biological terms, expect the unexpected. This is the list of NTDs, don't worry about them, but they've added one last year, snakebite. Liverpool has been involved in snakebite for 50 years. This is one of the biggest killers, people working in rural areas in the world. 100,000 people die a year of snake bite. Probably 300,000 are maimed and disabled permanently by snake bite, and there's very little we can do about it. But what are the features that bring these diseases together? They're a proxy for disadvantage, they affect the poorest, so populations with limited political voice, stigma, discrimination, disability, but particularly what we've been working on is the impact of these conditions on mental health and depressive illness. There is a huge burden of mental illness associated with these conditions. And they have an underestimated impact on morbidity and mortality. The global burden of disease figures for mortality estimated the number of annual deaths at 150,000 it's actually probably about 450,000 because they don't include those conditions that kill people. The trematode conditions in Asia, which cause bowel cancer, they don't include rabies and snake bite. They don't include epilepsy because 30% of global epilepsy is caused by an NTD, neurocystosicosis, and they can be controlled, eliminated, and even eradicated. But for me, the biggest issue here is the inequity of health assistance for NTDs. Bernard Lisa, formerly of the World Bank, did a two calculations. This headlined our series in The Lancet in 2010. 0.6% of official development assistance for health was going towards control of the diseases which affected a billion people, at least. That is inequity. So we're trying to redress that. DFID and USAID are at the forefront of that. But the issue here is the link between health systems and NTDs, and I've listed these on the slide, but I want to focus on one. The drugs that we give for preventive chemotherapy of NTDs are actually given by pharmaceutical companies free. Of those donations, 70% of the donated products agreed by WHO under donating pharmaceuticals reach people's mouths in a year. That's a huge number, and that's because the supply chains are actually effective. And at the end of the road, the figure I give for the River Blindness Programme was 100 million treatments in Africa were given by the River Blindness Programme in every year. 50 million of that 100 million reached communities which were more than 20 kilometres from any health facility. Now that means that people are getting these drugs. Why do they get them? Because the communities demand them. It's their only health intervention they get from the National Health Service. So we are reaching people far beyond where the health services themselves are reaching. These are the lists of companies which are providing the products, but what I want to point out is the value of those products, given free, is two to three billion, billion dollars per year. So the cumulative amount of money which has been given by pharma is probably up to now 50 billion dollars worth of drug, which the countries would have to pay for themselves because they're all on the essential medicines list. So the leverage you're getting from the pharmaceutical industry is enormous. And the other thing to point out, and I haven't got a slide on this, but just to remind you, that 35% of the antimalarials in Asia and in sub-Saharan Africa are counterfeit. These are not. These are quality products. It's all around partnerships. DFID has been part of this partnership. This is just the filariasis one, 
But the important thing about the partnerships, it's WHO, it's the World Bank, it's the bilateral donors, it's the NGDOs, it's academia all working together. And all the NTD disease programmes have got effective partnerships. What I want to point out, and I reiterate the point about mental health. This is a WHO document on mental health and development. If you take the executive summary of this document, these are the bullet points which emerge as the core features of people suffering from mental health. Within this book, not a single mention of any of these diseases, but they're all absolute characteristics of the neglected tropical diseases. And if you look at the mental health literature, there is also absolutely no reference in the core mental health literature, including in Vikram Patel's work of neglected tropical diseases. I mentioned innovation. This is the guinea worm program, which Delner is very familiar with. You can't have more innovation than in the guinea worm program, where we've moved from around a million cases a year to 30 last year. Drinking straws, plastic drinking straws with a filter on the end to stop people taking the copepods in which infect them. Tissue sold in markets emphasising the, the need for filtering water and the uh, consequences of guinea worm and how you control it. The name of guinea worm in Bambara, in Mali, the language Bambara, is the disease of the empty granary. People were disabled, they couldn't harvest the crops, so they went hungry the following year. The other thing is health education. This is an exercise book from Burkina Faso. Every primary school child had that exercise book. It costs very little to print on the cover how you avoid guinea worm and how you report it. I can't think of a cheaper, more effective health intervention because the knowledge of guinea worm, which is one of the measures how we certify countries, is do you know how it's transmitted? How do you report it if you see a case and so on? Highly effective, absolutely no technical input to this disease at all and yet it's been one of the most successful eradication programs. Here you see an emerging worm and just to show you the figures down to 2016 was 22 cases, last year 30 cases, 15 in Ethiopia and 15 in Chad. Unfortunately the problem as Gellner well knows in guinea worm is we have a problem with animal infections particularly dogs in Chad which we're trying to resolve. I show this slide because it was a village, Samandini, Burkina Faso, epic historically. This is where McNamara was taken in 1973 or 4, where the Onchocerciasis control program started. Samandini was abandoned. Why was it abandoned? This is a similar village just south of Ouagadougou. My colleague, who sadly passed away last year, David Baldry, talking to the males of the community. Not a single male in this community had any sight. That was in 1974. Now, river blindness is not a cause of blindness anymore in West Africa. The filariasis program started by DFID, George Faux, Smith Klein Breacham, now Glaxo Smith Klein, has now eliminated as a public health problem in all these countries to date. There are over half a billion treatments a year in about 70 countries. It's been eliminated in public health, including Malawi, Togo, Maldives, okay, small island, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, and last week, Egypt, finally said there is no more transmission of lymphatic filariasis in a disease which has been affecting Egypt since the times of the pharaohs. This slide gives you the rationale for the policy and prioritisation of NTDs. All these issues I think have been critical in the success of these programmes. But let me remind you, and some of you will see the issues, our unit cost per treatment in sub-Saharan Africa varies between 10 and 30 cents per person per year treated of free drugs. You will know what the annual per capita expenditure is in Africa, Malawi, Liberia, Mali, around $26 per person per year from all sources. So even in the poorest countries, the cost of delivery to the health system would be between 1% and 3% of what they spend at the present time on health. Given the leverage the essential medicines make, that is a trivial amount of money, even from the poorest countries' national health budgets to deliver free drugs which they would otherwise have to pay for. So these diseases also, if you tackle them, look at issues of equity, essential medicines, we know they're effective, is ethical, is issues of equality and access, and we can eradicate some of them and eliminate them. Beware of Aedes aegypti. The problem has been that vector biology by the donor community has been ignored for 30 years. The first sections when health sector reform came in was to remove the vector control outfits. And this is really a huge problem of capacity. 
I've listed the challenges. Guinea worm is a challenge. We're near eradication. There's only two endemic countries left. And the issue is the surprise of dog infections and the definition of eradication, because the definition of eradication is the zero global incidence of a specific pathogen. There's no statement of whether that pathogen comes from a dog, a cat or a human. So that is a massive issue. We are lucky that as yet drug and insecticide resistance has not emerged, but we suffer from a limited capacity of the health system. And urban settings, a subject on which we just published a paper in The Lancet, are actually a real challenge because of their diversity, their social diversity, the absence of any base in appropriate health systems <laughs> in a sense that m many people do, uh, depend on the private sector, rapid change, and so on. Anyway, these are all on the slides. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you for your attention.